Hello friends, welcome to Village Idiots for Christ, we're nuts for Jesus and just plain nuts. For out of our mind, it's for the sake of God, if we're in our right mind, it's for your sake. Second Corinthians 5, 17, crazy people can serve Jesus, so here we go. Um, we're giving you our Easter message, it's my four favorite pictures of Jesus after the resurrection. And so this is going to go about 30 minutes probably. Uh, we're going to be, the one picture is in John 21, final chapter of John, the next three in Revelation. So uh, we'll just jump right on in and we'll go ahead and get going here. So picture number one of Jesus Christ after the re resurrection is the humble servant. We're going to go John 21 verses 1 through 14 and we're going to break it down. We're going to break it into sections here. So uh, we'll start with John 21, 1 through 3. Again, you're going to see the, the, the light. You know, <laughs> well, I hope you see the light. Amen. So we're, um, uh, we've got the flashlight on the Bible. I'm in my car again, as you can tell. And so I've tried to balance out the lights here as best I can. I think this is a good look. I got my hat on, got some of the shadow off my head. So here we go. Let's jump in here. This is the humble servant, picture number one. So I'm giving you the exact same message that I gave them on Sunday. And so here we go. This is what the Lord gave me, the Holy Spirit gave me. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, um, uh, the sons of Zebedee and the two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night caught nothing. So we know by counting up the, uh, the, the disciples and the apostles, there were seven total. And for some reason, it didn't name the, the last two. But there were seven apostles with Jesus at the Sea of Tiberias. Amen. And so uh, verse 4. Verse 4 is, um, uh, Early in the morning, Jesus stood out on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. I love this. It's, I don't know if Jesus was keeping his identity secret because sometimes he did that, especially after his resurrection. But it was kind of, it's, it always indicated something to me in Jesus, a playfulness in his heart. Like, hey, surprise, it's me. <laughs> I love that. I see Jesus uh, pulling jokes like that on these guys. Amen. Let's read 21 verse 5. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. So he's checking in with the boys on the water who don't recognize yet. Hey, friends, uh, do you have any fish? Isn't this cool? He's still calling them friends. After they abandoned him in the garden, they still call him friends. John was the only one that went to the cross with Jesus. The, one, the only one apostle that made it to the cross. Uh, John 21, verse 6, next verse. Jesus, uh, he said, or Jesus said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did this, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Amen. This is an exact repeat, and this is so cool. In Luke chapter 5, and I think probably maybe Matthew, I'm not sure, but definitely Luke 5, um, the, Jesus began his ministry when he had the boys throw the net out. I believe it's on the right side, and they caught such a, a, a haul of fish it almost sunk the boat. And uh, Jane, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, had to bring their boats over and because it was Peter's boat. And so there was so much fish, it filled up all the boats. And so Jesus is, is going full circle here. He, he started his ministry, or part of the beginning of his ministry was this miracle of the fish. And now the end of this, his ministry, his earthly ministry, is the, the miracle of the fish again. And I love that. And I just love the nature of that, the full full circle nature of that. All right, John 21, verses 7 through 9. Don't worry, this is all going somewhere. This is going to show you the humble servant here. Just bear with me here. We have to break it down this way so you understand. Then the disciples whom Jesus loved said to that then the disciple who Jesus who G, whom Jesus loved said to Peter, that's J, uh, John was the disciple Jesus loved. Um, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing it, towing the net full of fish for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. Okay. So Jesus had started a fire. And so Jesus had a fire already going with bread and fish on. He was preparing, he already knew what he was going to do uh, for the boys here. All right, John 21, verse 10. 
Uh, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. And so Jesus wanted to make sure there were seven of them, plus Jesus ate. So there probably weren't enough fish cooking. So Jesus wanted to make sure, hey, bring some more fish. We need some more. He wanted to make sure everybody had enough to eat. I love that. Uh, and now John 21, 11 through 14, and that'll end it right here. Then we'll make the point of what we're looking at here. Amen. Uh, Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to disciples after he was raised from the dead. Amen. So third time he appeared to disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, here's the point of 1 through 14. We're going to summarize here. Other than John, these are the boys, these are the boys, or his, these are the apostles, his boys, who both denied him and ran away from him at his darkest moment, his darkest moment in the garden before he was crucified. And yet he says to these men, come and have breakfast. Let's recap the total list of what's happened here so you can have the, the whole picture, and then we'll break it down. Uh, he first of all he calls them friends. Then he reduced. Then number two he pre reproduces the miracle fish. Number three he builds a fire and starts to cook for them. Number four he makes sure that all are provided for. And number five he invites them to breakfast and then serves them personally. Now here's the point. Jesus Christ at this point was resurrected from the dead. He had already gone through his passion. He had already been through his sorrow on the cross. All of God's love poured out on the cross in Jesus' sorrow so he could pay for the sins of men. And yet now he is the resurrected King of kings and Lord of lords. He's now the ruler of all of God's creation. He was victorious over sin, hell, death, and the grave. And yet he's still humbly serving, making a fire, cooking bread and fish for them on it. And so... For any one of us, any one of us who is in leadership, and I'm in leadership, and I know many of you are, but if you're in leadership in the body of Christ, of course, this is the true, the true template of how we are to serve others. Not being served as a leader, but serving, humbling ourselves, doing the grunt work, doing the, the things that were, were, uh, we're not, you know, weren't, you know, weren't the glorious, you know, uh, standing on a mountaintop type thing. Jesus did the normal things here. He served them. He cooked for them. He called them friends and he made them breakfast. If you're a leader in Christ, be a leader. A lead. And Jesus said, I remember this now. Jesus said, you want to be the greatest uh, uh, of, of um, you, uh, who is the greatest in the king? The greatest in the king is the servant and slave to all. And Jesus on the cross became a servant and slave to all. So if you want to be great, serve as many as possible. Allow God to lead you into service as a leader. And I still remember this, and I remember listening to this and being blown away by it. So, amen. So there's number one, uh, the, the humble servant. Number two is the glorious king. Now, the rest of these are all in Revelation. We're going to put a plug in there for Revelation in a second. So I'm going to turn to Revelation over here, all the way into the back of the book. Because it's in the, if you don't know, Revelation is in the back of the book. And so, here we go. Read my Hebrews. All right. Revelation. Okay, of course, and now I'm at 13. So I got to go back a few pages. This is These are the technical difficulties. Because we're actually using an actual Bible, and I've given a plug before. If you don't have a physical Bible, you better buy one. AI is changing it. You better get yourself one in your hand that you, use, that you consider reliable. And I consider this as a... This is an earlier version of New International. I don't consider the present New International as reliable as this. And so I've got an older version of New International. My dogs ate one of these, and I, fortunately for my mom, got a second one. But you better get a Bible in your hand that's made out of paper that's printed, already printed. AI is changing the Bible. And AI is changing a lot of things. There's an AI Jesus out there too, which doesn't has nothing to do with the truth. So be careful of AI. It'll take it'll it'll destroy you. Amen. AI has its purpose, but it also has its darkness. So, again, don't want to get into all that today. So we're in Revelation chapter 1. And uh, we're going to talk, first of all, I want to talk about the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a completely unique book in the Bible. It is part of the canon of Bible. God chose to close out the canon of Bible with this book. But 
It is a standalone and separate separate from the rest of the Bible because it was written differently. And I'm going to explain this. I'm going to show you right here how it's how it was written differently. A second Peter verses. And by the way, I'm looking over here because I got my tablet over here, looking over this way. My tablet. This is what I use to preach this message in church because uh, I want all my notes down. In Second Peter one, chapter Second uh, Peter chapter one, verses twenty and twenty, it says that men were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Uh, when they received the revelation of God's word, again, which is what we call the Bible. So uh, the Bible was given to us by Holy Spirit leading men uh, uh, and, and to write down the words that God wanted written. But this book is differently. This book wasn't received from the Holy Spirit. Listen to Revelation 1 verses 1 and 2. Here we go. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known to them, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to, to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay. The, this, um, this is the revelation of Jesus. This is the book of Revelation or the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the revelation again of Jesus Christ, which God the Father gave him to show his, oh, wait, wait, wait I'm reading, I'm, Okay, I apologize. I was rereading this exact same thing. And this book, okay, here it is right here. I apologize. I, hey, no, no, there's no editing here. Can you tell? <laughs> this book is directly from the fa from Father God, testifying of his son, Jesus Christ, given to an angel. And an angel revealed this to John, not the Holy Spirit. Yes, John had the Holy Spirit. Yes, of course. But he wasn't being led by the Spirit the same way the rest of the authors of the Bible were, including he himself who wrote the Gospel of John. And so, um, and we know for sure that an angel was revealing this to him because twice at the end of the book in Revelation, John in error erroneously falls at the feet of the angel and starts worshiping. And the angel says, whoa, 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 boy. He said, I'm a fellow servant with you and with your, your brothers and prophets. Uh, so this book is is important. You should be in this book. It's like an onion. And it, um, um, it's just got layers upon layers. And the more you're in this, and again, there's a blessing. That's right. I'm coming to that now. Uh, there's this, um, uh, there's, a, there's a, a blessing attached to this. But again, as I'm reading over here, this is God's final, this is the Father's final revelation of his son, Jesus Christ. And God himself chose to close out the canon of scripture with this book. Uh, and that's why in this hour, this book is so misunderstood, but it's so important. You need to know what's in this book. And again, there's a blessing attached to this. And this is the only book with this blessing. Watch this. The very next verse says this. It says, blessed, verse, is this chapter one, verse three. Blessed is the one who reads the words of, the pro of this prophecy and blessed is the one who hears it and takes to heart what is written in it because the time is near. And so you will be blessed if you listen to this book. I'm audio Bible guy from a truck driver. I've been audio Bible and for about 24, 25 years. So you'll be blessed if you hear it. You'll be blessed if you read it. And then if you heed it and do what's in it. And oral tradition 2000 years ago when this book was written, it was all they had. They had scrolls that were read to them. No one had Bibles like we have. The, the precious gift of the Bible in your hand is such a precious gift. You have no idea. So amazing. And so... And again, he said the time, he says uh, here and written because the time is near. If the time was near 2,000 years ago when this was written, approximately 2,000 years ago, how much closer is the time near now? We are so close to the end. I mean, they're right now talking more and more about the red heifers and rebuilding the temple. And that has to happen for Antichrist to come. It's part of the deal where he goes into the rebuilt Jewish temple and declares himself to be God. So we are getting close to the end. Be of good cheer and just endure to the end. As, as the Bible says, we have to endure to the end. So we're going to go here now. So I just want to do a plug, a plug for the book of Revelation itself. Such an important book. You need to be in this book. So important. Anyway, can, let's continue forward. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, continuing forward. All right. So again, you'll be blessed if you read or listen to this book and do what it says. So this is number two. This is the glorified king. And so this is the revelation of Christ, how he was truly God in a human body, much like the Mount of Transfiguration revealed himself to three of his apostles in glory with Moses and Elijah. 
This is the same experience. John has the same experience. We see the glorified God, a God again, God in a human body. So let's go ahead and turn to, and go to verse 11 in chapter 1. All right, verse 11, chapter 1. Um, all right, verse 11. Um, all right. Oh, oh no. Uh, verse 12, 12 and 13. Chapter one, verse 12 and 13. This is John seeing this. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. We know that's Jesus. He's identified as the son of man. Dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. Now here's the glory part. This is, uh, uh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, yeah, because call okay, yeah, it calls him the Son of Man. All right. And um so this is Jesus speaking to John. And then we could do fourteen through sixteen. Here we go. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all of its brilliance. My goodness. This is, I mean, imagine you're, imagine you're John seeing this. Let's go through the list here. Um, his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. That's amazing. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. Amen. I mean, he saw his feet like bronze. Amazing. And his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all of its brilliance. And so, again, so what is John's He sees all of this, and he knows Jesus Christ personally. He was with him for three and a half years. So what is his response? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. <laughs> now, his response was to fall at his feet as though dead. And so, um, I mean, he's seeing, he's seeing God in a human body. I mean, what? What, uh, what would we do? I think John gets this right. He, I believe he fell prostrate before Jesus Christ at this point. And now here's the cool part, though. Watch this. This is the rest of the story, the Paul Parvi moment, the rest of the story. Watch this. Now, Jesus, okay, when I saw my fellow see as though, then, then, then Jesus or he or Jesus placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. Now, <laughs> I can imagine Jesus being Jesus here, and John just falls out. and And in humor, I always say this stuff in humor. When you, in humor, imagine Jesus going, "Oh no, I just killed the guy." <laughs> I guess this was just too much. <laughs> and uh, but Jesus, what does Jesus do now? John is laying prostrate in front of him. So what does Jesus have to do? It says he placed his right hand. He placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. Jesus, glorified Jesus, had to stoop over. I mean, Jesus, I mean, Jesus says he's 5, 10, 6 foot tall. He's standing there in this glorified body. And John's on the ground. In order to put his hand on him, Jesus, I don't know if Jesus got down on one knee and placed his hand on John, but Jesus had to humble himself here and, and reach down in love and humility, reach down. And touched and touched John on the shoulder. I love this picture. So again, you see this humble servant. You see this glorified God man, God in a human body. You see this, and yet you see Jesus reach down and touch John. So he had to stoop down somehow, reach down, put his hand on him and say, don't be afraid. I mean, he's total power, total everything. And yet he's total love and total humility. Again, he is the glorious God, but he's still completely humble and still reaching out to us. And even today saying, listen, don't be afraid. Just walk with me. Don't be afraid. So, man, I, I love that he comforted John in that way. And, uh, man, um, in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, it says that Jesus was, that Jesus says, uh, um, he, that he's gentle and lowly in heart. And man, he is not kill, kidding. All of that power and glory, and yet perfectly humble and meek. That's the God we serve. Again, I'm teaching a message on love doesn't boast, and I'm using the first part of this message on Sunday to teach in the Indonesian church. 
But the opposite of boasting is being humble. You don't boast, you're humble. And Jesus was the ultimate humble one, the humble servant, the God-man, the God-slash-man, and yet uh, hum completely, perfectly uh, humble and meek. That's the God we serve. The God who has all power, all knowledge, is ever-present everywhere, is present everywhere all at the same time, yet completely humble. From from the from from Mary in the in the stable to the to the cross, completely humble life. And so that's the second picture. So you have the humble servant, the glorious God, now you have the lion and the lamb. Now we're gonna go over to Revelation chapter five. And this is spectacular here. And this is this is probably the longest. Well, first section was pretty long too, but but we we move quickly. We're speed preaching. Today, I, I told them Sunday, I'm a speed preacher. I usually do this with interpretation. And so not having an interpreter in English makes some things go a little bit quicker. So we're going to go to Revelation uh, chapter 5, and we're going to read one verses, uh, verses uh, 1 through 4 and talk about what's happening there. We're going to break this down again for you. Then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne, that's the Father sitting on the throne that John sees uh, in, in chapter 4, uh, sitting on the, uh, sitting, who sat on the throne, uh, a scroll, a scroll. Let's start over again. Then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. So, this is the scroll we find out later by chapter six. This is the first of the seven of the three judgments. Excuse me, um, the 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 the, um, the seal judgments, which are the birth pains of Christ, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments. So, this is the first of the three sets of judgments on the earth from God. And as we heard, no one was worthy. Uh, no one's no one that no one no one could be found that was worthy. And so, who is worthy again? We're going to find out in chapter, in verse 5, who is worthy. Um, let's see. I don't know what's about. Then one of the elders, an elder said to me, there's 24 elders around the throne. And we, you know, we don't have time to get into that. This is one of the elders here. Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. So the um, one of the 24 elders said to John, hey, hey, don't weep. Don't weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David is triumphed. That, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root and the offspring of David, actually. It doesn't say that here, but Jesus is the root of David, and he's he's the beginning of David. He's the root, he's the foundation of David, and he's the offspring. of. He's the beginning and the end of David. I love that. So he's the root of David, and the root of David, again, Jesus Christ. But wait, so so now we have Jesus identified as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. But watch these next verses, Lion and Lamb. This is so cool that God did it this way. The total symmetry here is amazing. The balance of all this will blow your mind. Watch this, 6 through 8. Then I saw a lamb. Isn't this cool? First, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the, the preceding verse. And then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. Man. <laughs> Again, even though he's identified as the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's the lamb also in heaven. He's still seeing the lamb that was slain. Now, now there's a lot going on here. Let's break it all down. Again, if he's again the lion and the lamb. The seven eyes and seven horns indicate his oneness with the Holy Spirit. There are seven lampstands in front of God's throne, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the world. We don't understand why it's seven. It's his per God's perfect number. 
but seven spirits sent all, into all the earth. The seven horns, the seven horns, the seven eyes. Don't know if that's metaphorical or uh, that's how John saw, but he saw seven eyes, the seven horns on Jesus' head, and he, or the lamb's head, which of course Jesus. And those are the seven that those that's the spirit of God. And so you see the Trinity right here: the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all together. The, and right there before God's throne, the Holy Spirit, and they're right, right there at God's throne, the Lamb with the Spirit just right showing up on His face, the way He, the way that John saw it. Again, um, and Jesus was the only worthy one to take that scroll because He died and paid the price for it all. He's the only worthy one uh, that, that takes uh, He takes the scroll from the Father's hand. And again, we know that Jesus Christ is God because he receives worship from the 24 elders and the four living creatures. And worship is reserved for God. So we know the Trinity is true because Jesus receives worship. Absolutely. And right there in the middle of it, now this is the little footnote here, but at the very end of it, again, each one, the, 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 the four living creatures and 24 elders all had a harp. And they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So we are incorporated into this picture. Our prayers are incorporated into this glorious picture of Jesus as the lion and the lamb. Get a hold of this. This is good stuff. You're in there. I'm in there because we pray. Don't ever discount your prayers. The golden bowls, God sees your prayers in golden bowls. I don't know how metaphorical this is, how real this is to God, whether the prayers actually trans, uh, transmutate into something different and they're in golden bowls. I don't know, but that's what it says here. They each had golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayer. God sees your prayers as incense, a beautiful aroma before him. Don't ever think your prayers don't matter to God. They do. Absolutely. But wait, there's more. Now, it's again, this picture goes on and on. Watch this, 11 through 14. And again, we are 26 minutes in, but you're just going to have to cut me some slack on this one. This is an important one. You can break this down in two or three parts, and you don't have to listen to it all at once. But these are important things. We're going to jump over the song they sang. Um, um, well, I tell you what, let's go through this real quick. I'm just going to read the song they sang. This is the new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe, language, and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. His own blood paid for it all. There it is right there, the blood of Jesus. Let's keep going. I just want to do a footnote there. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they sang again, song number two here. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power uh, and wealth and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and praise. Then, uh, then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and, and all that is in them singing... Sorry. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures, the four living creatures say to Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. And fell down and worshiped. Man, there's a ton going on here. But let's let's cover a couple parts of it. It says ten thousand times ten thousand angels. That is one hundred million angels that were circling the throne. Now, buddy, that's a bunch of angels. I can't imagine what John saw here to see the volume of angels. I don't believe that was metaphorical. I believe there was this hundred million plus angel. Again, not an exact number, of course, but the point is all the hosts of heaven worshiping. And watch this. Now it says here, every creature in heaven and on earth and under earth, which I believe is Hades or hell, you know, under the earth and everything on the sea that swam on the sea and everything in the sea was worshiping Christ. And the four creatures and the 24 elders were worshiping Christ. <laughs> he indeed is the lion and the lamb. He indeed is everything. Everything will worship Christ in the end. Everything, even in hell, they'll be worshiping Christ. Man, amazing picture here of the lion and the lamb. And we're, now we're closing out. Ah, oh, we're 29. We may close in five or 10 minutes. So this might go 40 today, but if it does, it does. Again, this is important. Now here's the final one, the all conquering king. And of course, this makes sense. We know Jesus Christ is coming back as a conqueror. And 
We're going to talk about this in a minute. Let's go over to chapter 19. We're in 11 through 16, and I don't know how we're breaking that down yet. Uh, all right, we got to turn back more. Actually, turn back one more page there. All right, so we are the all-conquering king. Let's turn over to chapter 19, Revelation, verses 11 through 16. Uh, so let's just break, and, we're, and I, as I wrote here in my tablet, I see how I'm breaking this down. So let's just get going here. Uh, I have 18. I went back one too many pages. All right, Revelation 19. All right, verse 11. Uh, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. So let's let's talk about this. First of all, I saw heaven standing open. So John literally had an open vision. Heaven was just open right in front of him, whatever that means. But he saw heaven itself open. And then he saw Jesus, who is the faithful and true one. It says, um, He's, and before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Jesus is the faithful and true one. You never have to worry about Jesus lying. Like the Father, he is incapable of lying. There is no lie inside of God that says that God cannot lie. Jesus cannot lie. He's completely faithful and true. He says he said himself, I am the way of God, the truth of God, and the life of God. And he didn't say of God, but that's what he meant. He's, he's God's way, truth, and life. And so there's nothing but life inside of Christ. So you don't have to worry. If you've planted your hope in Christ as I have, then you are completely secure in that hope. He will never leave or forsake you, as the word says. Now let's read, let's read verse 12. And we're breaking this down. Um, his eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He, um, so um, uh, he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. So again, his eyes are like blazing. Again, we see the glorious God here. His eyes are like blazing fire, just like John saw. Okay, and verse 13. Um, uh, let's see. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. So when God said at the beginning of the book, let there be light, that was Jesus. It says in John chapter 1 that he was the Word of God made flesh. So God's Word, his very Word, is his Son, became flesh. This picture is so amazing, and again, he was he was he had a robe that was dipped in blood, and of course, it was his own blood. You know, it's his own blood that paid for everything. And again, and his name, of course, the Word of God. Verse fourteen. All right, here we go. Um, uh, fourteen. Uh, turn over to fourteen. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, and dressed in clean and in, in 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 fine linen, white and clean. And again. The righteous ones dressed in fine. These are the robes representing righteousness. And again, um, the hosts of heaven coming with him. If it's a pre-tribulation rapture, it'll be us uh, us with him coming back. If it's not a pre-trib rapture, it'll be angels coming with him. But this host of heaven, and there's speculation, depending on how you see the trib how you see the rapture is how you'll interpret this verse. But that he's going to be coming from the sky on a horse from heaven to earth with this host, these armies of heaven with him again. Amen. And um, verse 15, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress in the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Now, this is so important. Let me shut my little light off here because I'm going to die trap for a, mo a moment or two here. And God, Jesus Christ is God's express agent of vengeance and recompense upon the earth. And I'm going to balance all of this out. It is God's, it is mine to repay that God says this. Vengeance is mine. It is mine to repay. He is going to repay through his son. Jesus is the one who sits on the great white throne judgment to judge the damned. He is the one that will sit, be, that we'll stand before at the judgment seat of Christ, although that won't be a judgment in wrath, but a judgment in mercy. But Jesus Christ is God's express, um, express agent of wrath upon the earth. And he is the one that, that is, that will handle all of it. Now, let's, let's read it again. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And, and, I, and I covered this, but I didn't cover it well enough on Sunday. 
Because people go, wait a minute, where's this God of love? You know where the God of love was? The God of love was there three days before when his son was crucified. All of God's love, all of his mercy, all of his grace was poured out upon the cross in Jesus Christ. And God has made the cross the central figure for all of us, the central image for all of us. That's why the cross remains. That's why we talk about the cross. That's what we look at, the cross. You want to see God's love, you see the cross. When Jesus stretched out his hand to be nailed to the cross, he stretched out his, his hands in love and says, I love you this much. So God's love was completely portrayed and completely given. All of his love was given at the cross through Jesus Christ. And now, so so, so, what's all this wrath stuff? This is for those who reject the cross. This is for those who reject Jesus Christ as Lord. And these people in this hour will have no excuse. Two witnesses supernaturally preaching from Jerusalem for three and a half years, 144,000 witnesses, all those converted during the tribulation witnessing for Christ. There will be no excuse. Men will know either it's Antichrist or Christ. But, but again, God is love. But again, it is his to repay, and he's going to repay through his son. And that's just the way it is. And that's not a popular message. But again, in this hour, people need to repent. We need to talk about repentance. We need to talk about the law. Because outside of Jesus Christ, all there is is the law of God. All there is is the Old Testament. All there is is punishment and wrath outside of Jesus Christ. All that are outside of Jesus Christ will experience God's wrath in some form or fashion. And so that is what it is. If you don't want Jesus, you get wrath. If you don't want Jesus, you get the justice that Jesus took for you on the cross. That's how it is. That's the balanced picture here. Lion and lamb, glorious God, yet humble servant. It's all in there. But you have to acknowledge Jesus Christ. You have to you receive him into your heart. You have to repent. You have to believe he rose from the dead and you have to receive him as your Lord and Savior. <sighs> So again, diatribe in there, but this is so important. And this, there's so there's no balance in most churches anymore. If they've taken the crosses down, we don't talk about the blood. Why? Because we we want to be seeker we want to be seeker sensitive. We want to be friends. Well, you know what? Well, yeah, we should be friends with our brothers in church. Of course, we should. But we need to talk. We don't just want to talk about heaven. We need to talk about hell. We need to talk about punishment. We need to talk about wrath. We need to tell people the truth that outside of Jesus Christ, Christ, you're going to suffer and pay for your own sin forever. That's the truth. So let's keep going on here. Verse 16. And this is so cool. This is one of my favorite pictures. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Um, I'm going down here. <laughs> On his on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now get this. I'm shutting my little light off here. On his robe, okay? So he's wearing this glorious robe, with white robe. And it says, King of Kings on the robe. Probably down below his waist says, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. I don't think it's across his chest like Superman. It's probably down low, says King of Kings. But it says, on his robe and on his thigh is written King of Kings and Lord of Lords on his thigh. That's the meaty part of your leg between your knee and your hip. That's your thigh. And it's God has, now, <laughs> I did a joke on Sunday, but God has tattooed his own son. And you read the Old Testament, God wasn't a big fan of tattooing back then. But God has tattooed, and I'm using this, I'm doing this in, in tongue in cheek, but God has written, not tattoo, I'm using tattoo, but God has written King of Kings and Lord of Lords on Jesus' thigh. Why? And my theory is, and I'm surmising and theorizing here, that as Jesus is coming back, he's dun 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 right of the Valkyries coming down. You know, he's coming on a horse. Think about this. He's coming from heaven on a horse. And all the hosts of heaven are coming on horses. Are they flying at the speed of light? We don't know. Wouldn't it be cool if you could combine Jesus Christ and Star Trek? And you got, you know... <laughs> Can you imagine, you know, Captain Kirk or Captain Jean-Luc Picard flying and they see this big horse go by them <laughs> and he's flying faster than the speed of light with all the hosts of heaven. And they're all going, what was that? <laughs> but he's coming from heaven on a horse. Just let that blow your mind. <laughs> So, but anyway, that was a small diatribe, but that's fun. But anyway, he's coming from, 
He's coming from heaven. I theorize that maybe his 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 robe, because of the wind, if you're flying at the speed of light, there's probably a little wind. 180,000 miles per second, yeah, probably a little wind. And so his, his robe flies up a little bit. And God doesn't want us to miss this. Okay, if you don't see it on his robe, guess what? You're going to see it on his thigh. King of kings, the Lord. God's letting us know for sure this is the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and I've identified him on his robe and on his thigh, just in case so you know, kids, don't miss this one. So don't miss this. He's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's for fun. I love that. The whole the whole Star Trek thing came into my mind. I'm going, oh my gosh, that's too weird. Um, so that's how important this is. God made sure. Again, this is the father's testimony of his son. So he's 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 the one deciding all of these things. So it's God's decision to write or tattoo on his own son, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, just so we can't say, well, how I didn't see it. His robe threw up. How would I know he was a king? Well, he's flying on a horse from heaven. You should know this. But even if you can say, well, I didn't see it, God. I swear I didn't see it. I didn't see King of Kings and Lord of Lords. God's going to so say, not so. On his thigh it was written too, boy. <laughs> Oh man. So again, very cool. The whole the whole thing on his thigh just blows. So let's go back. Let's 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 close it up. We're at 40 minutes here. Let's close this up quickly. I don't want to go 45 and I have to. Jesus is the humble servant, the glorious God, the lion and lamb, the all-conquering king. Jesus is all in all. I mean, man, I mean so how do you conclude this message very quickly? A pastor friend once told me, Pastor Billy, hey, that's for you, Pastor Billy, told me. We're in Charlotte, and I preached a message in Charlotte out of home, and I ended on a down note, and he said to me, don't ever, don't ever end a sermon on a down note, only on an up note. So I'm going to, I'm going to give you the up note. The up note to end the sermon is, is the, in Isaiah 30, verse 15, 30, chapter 30, verse 15, is the entire gospel in one verse. Get this. And repentance and rest is your salvation, and quietness and trust is your strength. First part of the verse is all about Jesus. And repentance and rest is your salvation. We come and re repent. We acknowledge we're sinners. We come to Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. I repent to you. I ask you to forgive me. And then what does Jesus say? Come to me, all you are heavy laden and burdened. I'll give you what? Rest. So in repentance and rest is our salvation. And so we receive this. And then what do we do? In quietness and trust is our strength. So when we get saved, it quiets our soul. It quiets our spirit down. We're saved. We're free. We've been set free by Jesus, by his blood. We, our souls get quiet and we trust him. And then we're made strong in that quietness of our soul and our trust in him. We're made strong. So in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is our strength. Because Jesus Christ is, is raised from the dead. He, again, has become our repentance and rest. And in that, it calms our soul and we come to perfect rest. And so who is Jesus? <laughs> who is he? He is our King, our God, our Lord, our Savior, our husband, and our friend. Jesus Christ, returning to a planet very near and dear to us, this one. Returning to a planet near, near and dear to us, this one very soon. <laughs> ah, 42 minutes and 47 seconds. Love you, love you. Can't get enough of you. Sorry I went so long, but this was important. We had to get, we have to, to dice this one up right. The humble servant, the glorious God, the lion and lamb, and the all-conquering king. He's everything. Just receive him today as Lord. Humble yourself, repent, and give your heart to him totally, and watch him change your life completely. Love you, love you. Can't get enough of you. See you tomorrow.